Hello, I'm Dick Wood, and a happy new year to you. We'll spend the next half hour recapping the old year, our first step into the 80s. Many of the stories we covered this past year were scheduled in advance, such as news conferences and public hearings. But not everything is always in the reporter's daybook. News, after all, is often spontaneous, unpredictable. Ralph Iannotti has a report on some of these events. Turning back the clock a few months, Dick, the single event that stands out most vividly occurred on Sunday morning, September 7th. The day started routinely enough. People were washing their cars and mowing their lawns, but it was a false sense of security. Something was about to happen which showed how vulnerable we were and set the stage for catastrophe. Let's take a look. For seven hours that Sunday, more than 300 firemen from a dozen companies battled to control a raging fire in two tanks at the mobile oil storage terminal at the Port of Albany. What could have been a catastrophe was averted. Luckily, miraculously, nobody was killed. Ten people, most of them firemen, sustained minor injuries. For the 22 people who boarded an Eastern Airlines jet in Albany on September 8th, it was anything but a routine flight to Florida. The plane was hijacked to Havana by a homesick Cuban refugee. Going into 1981, the proposed Crossgate Shopping Center in Gilderland is still iffy. The Department of Environmental Conservation, saying it lacks sufficient data, so far has refused to give the mall a green light. In Pittsfield, the proposed Pyramid Mall blueprint was rejected by Mayor Charles Smith, who refused to sign an agreement with developers. That wasn't the only news out of Pittsfield. The police department there came under public scrutiny when nearly 50 counts of misconduct were lodged against a veteran police lieutenant, one of the charges having sex with a female officer while on duty. Misconduct charges may confront other Pittsfield police in 1981. In the city of Johnstown, two police officers were accused of official misconduct and suspended from the force on morals-related charges involving a teenage girl. Police in Schenectady had some headaches of their own. They didn't like the way the police overtime lists were being used. A threatened police job action never materialized. The PBA called for the ouster of Police Chief Joseph Peters. Peters didn't quit, but he did announce plans for an early retirement. A police walkout wasn't the only strike threat in Schenectady. Another one involved nurses at Ellis Hospital. However, an 11th hour agreement averted a hospital strike. In Catskill, racial fights at Catskill High School resulted in that school's closing for two days last September. Some blamed it on a community-wide racial problem. And classes were temporarily canceled at Williams College in the small college town of Williamstown, Massachusetts, because of rising tensions stemming from a cross-burning incident and vandalism in the library of the Black Student Union. I don't know about you, but as far as I'm concerned, I'm sort of glad to see 1980 slip quietly into the history books. It's funny, being human, we attach significance to the ending of one year and the beginning of another one. Nature uh, pays absolutely no attention to it. I think I'll start cleaning off my desk now and dedicate it to the new calendar year. I'm Ralph Iannotti. 1980 was a watershed year in American politics, highlighted by Ronald Reagan's landslide victory. This became a banner year for Republicans, especially conservative Republicans. And New York State, long thought of as the bastion of democratic liberalism, did not escape the national trend. Jimmy Carter had to have New York in order to win, and Ronald Reagan was able to deny him the Empire State. Reagan came to New York on several occasions, but brought his campaign to the Capitol District just once, on the eve of the state's presidential primary back in March. He came here to get his delegates elected, and his efforts succeeded. Locally, the delegates pledged to Reagan won. President Carter never came to the Capitol District this year, but he sent his wife, his number one surrogate, in twice. The first time before the primary, while the president was still playing the Rose Garden strategy for all it was worth. But the Rose Garden strategy was now starting to wear thin, and Senator Edward Kennedy had mounted a strong challenge here. On March 25th, Kennedy won New York's Democratic primary, and while his candidacy was destined to fail, New York gave Kennedy's challenge to the incumbent new life for the late primaries in the big industrial states. The presidential primary in New York also gave birth to a new wrinkle in the primary system, the Democratic caucuses. For the first time, Democrats gathered on a Sunday afternoon to select their delegates to the national convention. The system was confusing, the caucuses for the most part were not well attended, and there was a lot of clamoring for yet another change in the primary process. All through the spring, reporters kept badgering Governor Kerry about the presidential election, trying in vain to get the governor to choose between Carter and Kennedy. He wouldn't do it. He said he was seeking commitments on who would do the most for New York. 
Then Kerry started thinking about the vice presidency for himself. That didn't happen, and neither did the open convention that the governor campaigned hard for. He brought his call for the open convention, which in essence meant that President Carter should surrender his committed delegates, right to the floor of the convention in New York, all to no avail. But the New York delegates held firm. Those who went to the convention committed to Kennedy, voted for Kennedy. Now they can say, I told you so. For the Republicans, any remnants of divisiveness had disappeared by the time GOP delegates reached Detroit. They called the Republican convention a love feast, and the delegates did enjoy themselves as they nominated Reagan and Bush. They believed they had chosen a winning ticket, and they were right. For a time in Detroit, it appeared that Buffalo Congressman Jack Kemp had a good shot at becoming Ronald Reagan's running mate. It didn't happen, but Kemp's political stock rose in Detroit, and it has continued to rise ever since. He has become a national figure, and now he's being discussed as a candidate for governor in 1982. With the conventions out of the way, it was time for New Yorkers to turn their attention to the upcoming U.S. Senate primary. There were six candidates seeking the seat Jacob Javits had held for more than two decades. Democrats Bess Meyerson, Liz Holtzman, John Lindsay, and John Santucci. And Republicans Javits and little-known Hempstead presiding supervisor Alphonse D'Amato. Democrats chose Holtzman as their candidate. And conservative Republicans turned out to give D'Amato the upset of the year. It was the beginning of the end for Javits. The primary set the stage for November, a three-way race now with Javits running as the liberal. Riding the conservative tide, D'Amato squeaked by Holtzman and Javits ran a poor third. It was the state political story of the year, an unknown suburban supervisor toppling one of the most respected men in the U.S. Senate. The liberals lost with Javits and they also lost with John Anderson, who got New York Liberal Party backing after deciding to run for president as an independent. While the Liberals produced no winners, they did get some mileage out of their big-name candidates, and Anderson spent a great deal of time in New York, twice campaigning in the Capital District. Otherwise, Election 80 produced few surprises. The Republicans failed to capitalize on the Reagan landslide in the State Assembly, but did manage to maintain their hold on the Senate. The 105th Assembly District voters changed their representative. Democrat Gail Schaefer knocked off incumbent Republican Arlington Van Dyke. Locally, one of the year's big winners was Troy city manager John Buckley. Voters in Troy rejected a move to replace the city manager system with a strong mayor. And in Schenectady, they began 1980 by swearing in the city's first strong mayor in nearly five decades. Frank Ducey had changed the city's government and then got himself elected to head it. But in 1980, Ducey found it's tougher to govern than campaign. That's the political year in review. I'm Bob Lawson. The state of our economy was one of the major issues of the political year. Political promises aside, the problems of tight credit, unemployment, and double-digit inflation are with us in the new year. In a moment, a look back at our first step into the 80s in the money world. Economists, bankers, builders, consumers, and financiers had a tough time keeping on top of what was going on with our money in 1980. Our financial editor, Tony Malatino of E.F. Hutton Corporation, reviews our topsy-turvy economy for us. Wall Street began 1980 with a flurry. Stocks jumped on the new year with surprising gains. The month of January recorded one of the largest advances in stock market history. But stocks weren't the only things gaining ground. The price of gold soared over $300 an ounce in a matter of days, trading at over $870 per ounce before the frenzy was over. Silver nearly tripled in value in the same time, causing an avalanche of speculation. Gold and silver items literally came out of the woodwork as people rummaged through household belongings looking for anything that glittered. Long lines formed in front of gold and silver dealers' shops as anxious sellers were willing to accommodate the buyers. It wasn't long before the bubble burst. Gold plunged to less than $450 an ounce, and silver from $50 an ounce to somewhere around $10 an ounce, causing the celebrated Hunt Brothers of Dallas to lose over $1 billion in a matter of hours. The stock market gains were also wiped out as the Dow Jones Industrial Average took a 160-point straight downward plunge. By mid-April, interest rates reached a historical high. The prime lending rate hit 20%. As a result, the mortgage market dried up and real estate and housing entered the worst decline since the Depression. With no adequate financing around, buyers and sellers could only sit and wait. By the second quarter of 1980, the economy had come to a standstill. 
so much so that the price of gasoline started coming back down. Auto dealers were especially hard hit, experiencing very difficult times, and many had to close up. Then, almost as fast as they rose, interest rates took a dive down to less than 11%. Investors took heart to the lower interest rates, and Wall Street was once again riding high, with high technology and energy stocks leading the way. The Ronald Reagan victory fueled the fires of speculation, and the Dow Jones Industrial Average broke through the mystical 1,000 barrier. Consumers took advantage of the lower cost of borrowing by running installment debt to new highs. It wasn't long before we were back to square one, interest rates back to 20%. The much heralded economic business recovery was in trouble. Wall Street gains, again, quickly evaporated. As the year comes to a close, it's obvious that 1980 will not go down as a vintage year for the U.S. economy. The problem is that 1981 so far looks like much of the same, with high interest rates slowing any economic progress. Quite a challenge for the new Reagan administration, which has promised so much. I'm Tony Malatino. The desire for the dollar contributed seemingly more than ever to our crime statistics in 1980, from white-collar crimes such as embezzlement to home burglaries, those thieves in search of precious metals rather than TVs and stereos. There was no decrease in crimes of passion either, as we hear from Doug Myers. Dick, 1980 was a record year for crime in the Capital District. So far, nearly 9,000 people have gone to jails in Albany, Schenectady, Rensselaer, Saratoga, and Montgomery counties. Let's take a look at some of the cases that stand out in our minds. 1980 was a year that saw three young children die at Albany Medical Center, all victims of child abuse. Early in July, 21-month-old Angel Sousis was found badly beaten and later died. Salvador Suma later pled guilty to the murder and was sent to state prison. Two-and-a-half-year-old Jeffrey Dooley also died at Albany Medical Center, the victim of child abuse. A family friend, Nelson Burgos, ended his trial pleading guilty. He, too, was to draw a long prison term. And four-year-old John David Ross was beaten in Wilton, Saratoga County, only to die at the medical center. Michael Bizonette, the mother's boyfriend, was charged in the death. 1980 was also a year that saw scores of Albany women buying locks and guard dogs, as the man police called the Pine Hills Molester prowled this section of the city. He's yet to be caught and is believed responsible for nearly 50 break-ins and sexual encounters. Police say he's been idle for two months and may be in jail on another charge. In Montgomery County Court, John Hopkins was sentenced to from 25 years to life in jail after a long trial. He had been charged in the death of Cecilia Genetiempo. Thirteen Capital District banks were hit by thieves so far this year, stealing over $130,000. Suspects were nabbed in all but six stick-ups, and over $111,000 in loot has been recovered. Sports fans were shocked to learn that Albany's former New York Knicks basketball star, Tiki Burden, had been charged with holding up a Long Island bank. He was later charged with drug possession and remains free on bail. And 1980 was a year that saw the public get involved. In Saratoga, the brutal murder of Sheila Shepard prompted a $5,000 reward. Money offered up by friends, businessmen, relatives, and the city itself. But still no one has come forward to identify the killer that left the 22-year-old woman bound and gagged on her bed. 1980 was a year of arson. More cases, fewer solved. A crime that is increasing far too fast for law enforcement agencies to keep up with. It was a year for increased traffic arrests as area police departments continue to crack down on the speeders and drunks on our highways. And it was a year in which we heard louder cries for gun control as former Beatle John Lennon was gunned down in New York City. I'm Doug Myers. When we return, John McLaughlin takes a look at some people who made news in the 80s, and Bob Kovacic, for a change, will not be asked for a forecast. Despite all the stories about politics, fires, and natural disasters, it is predominantly people who make news. Well, Dick, that was certainly no less true during 1980 as we covered stories that encompassed the whole range of human drama and human experience. There was tragedy. The final chapter in the Joey Hoffbauer story was written in mid-July when the young cancer victim died. Joey's father would say later that he never regretted the unconventional treatment he chose for his son. 
And there was triumph. Kateri Tekakwitha, the young Mohawk maiden, was beatified by Pope John Paul II, the final step before sainthood. For the maestro Eugene Ormandy, the end of his 44-year-long and brilliant career with the Philadelphia Orchestra. Retirement also for longtime IUE business agent Joe Mangino, but not of his own volition. Rather, defeat in a union election. Another union man, PEF President John Kramer, would survive a grand jury probe and charges that he was a no-show state employee. Rensselaer County Judge M. Andrew DeWyer was a no-show. He never showed for his controversial assignments in Nassau County. Meyer Sandy Frusher, a favorite target for state workers upset with job evaluations. Frusher would be rewarded at year's end by being named labor commissioner. Peter Spurney, the man who managed the Lake Placid Olympics. A Senate committee said he actually mismanaged the Olympics. Spurney would be rewarded with a job heading up the New Orleans Exposition in 1984. In Albany, the end of a long and sometimes controversial career for Police Chief Edward McCardle, replaced by Tom Burke, a man more at ease with the public and the press. Stock car driver Tommy Corellis never got so much press. After all the headlines, Corellis would be held blameless in a fatal crash at Lebanon Valley. Another kind of driving, drunk driving, was the target for Doris Aiken and her Remove Intoxicated Drivers group, which finally made some headway in the state legislature. In March, an elderly woman, Lulu Robinson, would be found living underneath a sidewalk in Albany. She refused many offers of help, opting instead for a bus ticket back to her native Alabama. In November, two elderly Troy residents would be found living in subhuman conditions, conditions that shocked even hard-bitten policemen. They were taken to the hospital for badly needed treatment and kindness. In Amsterdam, Sister Anna Roberta, a Roman Catholic nun, was castigated by her superiors for teaching religion during Latin class. And finally, there was the nun, Sister Alice Mikowski, who grew increasingly impatient as she waited with her students in the Red Room for a tardy Governor Carey. And waited, and waited. He was trained by the nuns also, so I think he should remember what he, what he was taught by those nuns and come on time. John McLaughlin, TV 10, Action News. There's no other continuing event that affects more people than the weather. Our meteorologist, Bob Kovacic, has favored us with accuracy in his predictions all year, and now he has a chance to look back. Dick, this has been a year of weather extremes for our area, from a very rare snow drought last winter to a severe flood in March, then to a pleasant and warm summer, and finally to an increasingly dry period from summer through late fall. Last winter's total snow of 26 inches at Albany was the third least snowiest since the turn of the century. This made motorists happy, disappointed school kids, and caused serious financial problems for ski area owners. The snow drought thwarted the usual springtime flooding, but a major storm the third week of March produced record rainfall in the Catskills, with eight inches producing serious flooding in Greene County. Summer 1980 was the most pleasant, dry, and warmest summer in recent years. But the drought, which started in late spring, deepened through the summer and early fall, and this caused reservoir levels to lower dramatically. While not an immediate problem here, water supplies for the New York City area fell to under 40% in November, prompting a drought warning for southeastern New York State and New Jersey. Finally, cold weather settled in during October, with a 10-week period approaching winter 1980-81, showing temperatures 9 degrees below normal a figure that has raised area fuel bills well above last fall's levels. Leading into the new year, the drought could become of major importance by mid-spring unless we see significant amounts of rain and snow during the winter. Dick, that's a brief glimpse of some of the weather highlights during the past year. Thank you. Back in January, the folks in Lake Placid were wondering if enough snow would fall to put on the Winter Olympics. They took no chances and made their own and then proclaimed, Welcome world, we're ready. Well, it turns out we were not. More on that when we return. The tiny village of Lake Placid hosts the 13th Winter Olympic Games. It had a rough start and some heartbreaking moments, but in the end, a surprising triumph. Here's Ed O'Brien. Well, Dick, the problems were many for the Olympic organizers. There were cost overruns and construction delays. There's also a question about whether there would be enough snow on the ground to stage some of the events. There's also the matter of Taiwanese athletes and whether they would be allowed to compete. 
But the biggest problem to confront the Olympic organizers was a shortage of buses. That meant delays of up to several hours in sub-freezing temperatures, and some spectators missed their events altogether. But if those ticket holders were disappointed, think of how some U.S. competitors felt. For example, Ty Babylonia and Randy Gardner, the odds-on favorites to bring home gold medals in pairs figure skating. Where specifically is the injury, Dick? It's the thigh. The thigh. It's the thigh. So they have withdrawn. Oh. I was just told that by John Nix that they have withdrawn. Yeah. And then there was Linda Fradiani, another gold medal hope for the U.S. She was supposed to follow in the footsteps of Peggy Fleming, Dorothy Hamill, and all the others. But when the judges' votes were counted, Fradiani had finished a disappointing second to Annette Persch of East Germany. The world record is in jeopardy as Haydn turns down off the last turn. The world record, 14-34-3-3. But making up for those disappointments were some major triumphs, like Eric Haydn's five gold medals in men's speed skating. And the most memorable moment of all, when the unheralded U.S. hockey team shocked the world. Five seconds to the gold medal, four to the gold medal. This impossible dream comes true! It was the high point of the Winter Olympics, because no matter what problems the games had, they would always be remembered for this hockey victory by the USA. Ed O'Brien, TV10, Action News. The year 1980 started with our first pro hockey team halfway through its first season, and with the promise of another professional team, Eastern League Baseball, for the first time since 1959. Schenectady dropped the ball. And the ball bounced all the way to Glens Falls when the parties in Schenectady couldn't get the necessary approval for a playing site in time for the Eastern League season. The home opener for the Glens Falls White Sox was April 19th, with 6,100 fans on hand to welcome their new team that lost its first home game 3-2 to Waterbury. High school basketball in this area for two seasons was highlighted by one man, Sam Perkins of Shaker High, who was the talk of the Northeast in 1980 with his prowess at Shaker, which earned him high school All-America honors and a host of colleges and universities after his services. Rumors floated about, but it was Sam himself who told us where he would go to college. I'm not going to UCLA, and uh, I'm going to attend this fall at the University of North Carolina. Indeed, Sam has gone to North Carolina. He's an instant basketball hit as a freshman. The famed harness horse, Niatros, who has turned out to be probably the top pacer, if not harness horse of all time, winning $2 million in purses, came to Saratoga Harness having won 19 straight and had yet to be beaten. But on that day in early July, in the $100,000 Haswell pace, Niatros was being passed and suddenly went over the fence. And the reason still has many rumors about why, but nothing conclusive. Trenton Time was the winner that day as Niatros' unbeaten streak came to a halt at Saratoga. The sport of kings, or the annual summer highlight of the Northeast, the Saratoga Thoroughbred Meet, opened the last day of July to a record crowd of over 22,000. The meet went on to set all kinds of attendance and handle records, but it was who didn't run rather than who did in the famed Travers, which is always the big race at Saratoga. Horses like Spectacular Bid and Genuine Risk passed up the Travers, and it became the showcase of the horse that also had won the Belmont Stakes. Another highlight of 1980, and one not forgotten by Yankee fans, the controversial play in Game 2 of the American League playoffs, in which Kansas City swept the Yankees. It centered around Willie Randolph on base and Yankee third base coach Mike Ferraro, who hails from Kingston. There were many who questioned whether Mike should have waved Willie home, trying to score on a hit and run to left. One of those would be Yankee owner George Steinbrenner, but Mike defended his move. To tell you the truth, if uh, I had to make the same decision again, I'd do the same thing that I did because of the, you know, the, uh, the way the game was going. It was a 3-2 ball game. We needed to score a run, and it was a two out. And any time there's a two out situation, you've got to try and take a chance. Mike will get another chance next season, but as a first base coach. Those were just some of the highlights of 1980 from this area in the world of sports, and I'm Rip Rowan. And as they always say, in sports, there's always next year. So our first step into the 80s was a cautious one. We've not attempted to review the national and international events here. 
we remain in a precarious position of having Americans held hostage by a politically unstable Iran, which is in the midst of war in that oil-rich region. Given that, we are still an eternally optimistic people, hoping that the steps we continue to take will be more secure. Happy New Year from everyone here at Action News. Six twenty. He's gonna call back. Okay, you can also relate when you call somebody with a stick.